If you're anything like me, your desk has the tendency to collect knickknacks, toys, and other things that help you waste time and procrastinate your work. Well, in this video, I'll be showing you how to make three wooden puzzles that, once added to your collection, will help you waste even more time and make you thoroughly unproductive. So, let's get into it. Now, I wanted to make these puzzles look really nice by using some good-looking hardwoods. I headed to my lumber racks and I found some pieces that would be perfect, but they needed to be milled down to size. Once I found all the lumber I was going to need, I started the milling process over at the jointer, where I could square up one face and one edge. From there, I could take it to the planer and get it down to the proper thickness. I just set my calipers to the right dimensions, then once the boards could fit within them, I knew I had it just right. Next, I could start to cut out the pieces for the first puzzle on the table saw. Basically, I just ripped the boards down into strips that are perfectly square. And I did this for a bunch of maple, cherry, and walnut. Now I could cut them to their proper lengths. So, I grabbed my crosscut sled and I positioned my flip stop so that I can cut a bunch of them into tiny cubes. Checking with the calipers, Next, I needed to cut out some more pieces that were twice as wide, and some others that were three times as wide. Once done, I had a pile of cherry, maple, and walnut pieces, and now I could start to glue them together. I was going for some very specific shapes here, so I had to be careful and as precise as I could. I often used some of the pieces as spacers to make sure I was gluing things together in the right spot. And I also sprinkled some table salt on them to keep them from sliding around once I put the clamps on. It may sound weird, but it really works well. Plus, it makes the glue delicious. Now this puzzle's made up of seven pieces, so once I had them all glued up and in the clamps, I could give them some time to dry. And once they work, I could pop them out of the clamps. So, these shapes, if you know what you're doing, can be arranged in a way so that they form a cube. Now, I'm not going to spoil the puzzle here. That wouldn't be cool. I'll make a different video, and I'll spoil it in that one. But what we need now is a box to keep all these pieces in. Since we already have maple, cherry, and walnut for the pieces, I wanted to use something different, so I resawed down some ash. At the planer, I could get it down to its final thickness, and then over at the table saw, I could begin to cut out the pieces that will make the sides of the box. Now to really dress it up, I figured that it would look awesome if I used my box joint jig to give it some classy looking corners. Now if you haven't seen this thing before, it's pretty slick. This is quite possibly my favorite jig in my whole shop. There's a little bit of measuring and setup up front, but once you get the sides of the box clamped firmly to the back fence, you're on your way. Here's how it works. There's a tiny index key in the back that travels the gaps of whatever template you have installed. You make a cut, and then you slide the fence over one blade width and make another cut. Once you cut out all the material of one of those gaps, you simply lift the fence and place the key into the next one and keep moving on down the line. It's super easy. Once I reach the end of my pieces, I could shut off the saw and then give things a test fit. Perfect. I trimmed the front piece down a bit so that I could have room for a lid. And then I cut in a slot for the top to slide in on both of the sides. Now I can glue it up. I squeeze a drop into each of the gaps and then use my pokey stabber brush thingy to spread it around. And then I flip it over and I squish it into place. There's just something satisfying about watching drips of glue. Alright, well... You may have noticed that the fingers of the box joints were just a touch long. And that's so that once the box is dry, I can take it over to the disc sander and flush it all up perfect. The next step was to put on the bottom. So to do that, I just brushed on a tiny bit of glue, and then I dropped the whole box down onto another piece that was just slightly oversized. This lets me use my flush trim bit in the router table, and I can nip off the edges so that I can make it perfect. Now, since the slots for the lid go all the way through the sides, they left two holes in the back that mm, weren't much fun to look at. 
So I pressed in a tiny bit of glue and then I filled them. All right, now I can give the box a final sanding and get it all nice and smooth. For the lid, I thought it would be neat to use a piece of acrylic. It's thin enough that it fits into the slot and since it's clear, it lets people see the different colors of the pieces that are in the box. I started to sand all the puzzle pieces, but then figured, why not share this joyous moment with my boy and let him join in on the excitement and have some fun too. You having fun, bud? <laughs> Keep going. And approximately 10 seconds later, I was alone in the shop sanding by myself. I added my logo to the bottom, and then it was ready for finish. And for that, I just smeared on some oil and wax. I just figured trying to get an even coat of a spray-on finish would be nearly impossible. This is way easier to apply, and if they ever dry out in the future from being handled too much, I can always just give them another quick hit of oil, and they'll be good to go. So there it is. Done. It turned out awesome. That was a fun and easy little build. So fun and easy that I decided to make more than one. And by more than one, I mean several. And by several, I actually mean a bunch of them. I can squeeze one more out. There we go. It really did turn out pretty. All these pieces look really cool. The boxes turned out fantastically and look really good with the finger joints and the acrylic tops. I'll admit, it was a crazy amount of sanding, but in the end, I'm happy. And sore. Alright, on to the next one. For this one, I'm milling down some walnut. These pieces were a lot like me, in that they're kind of weird looking and they didn't really have much potential. But after I planed them down and I cut them to width, I could grab my crosscut sled again and trim the pieces down to perfect 4 inch squares. I added a chamfer at the router table and then set those pieces off to the side. Next, I cut down a thinner piece of stock and I trimmed that down into multiple pieces the same way. Now each of these pieces needs a slot cut into it, so I start by first marking out some locations where I could drill the ends out. Then at the drill press, I can poke a whole bunch of holes. I draw on some lines that connect those two holes and mark out all the rest of the material that needs to be removed. And to cut it out, I used a jigsaw. Now I know there's many other ways to make this little slot, but I needed to burn some calories, so I broke out my wood files and I went crazy smoothing out the cut to my guidelines. And I actually got them all looking really good. Since my crosscut sled only has one runner, I can position it off to the right of the blade. This lets me put chamfers on pieces that might be too small for the router table. Next, I milled down a thin piece of walnut and drew on a ton of little circles with my compass. I just figured that between inflation and the status of our economy that Pretty soon the value of our currency will collapse and everyone will be trading walnut coins for money. So I decided to get ahead of the game and preemptively make my own stash. I just sanded them down to the line at the disc sander and then I gave each one a subtle round over at the router table. Then each one got a little hole poked in the side at the drill press and then they were finished. Next up, I had to make some walnut beads. To make those, I started by using a hole saw and drilling out a bunch of them from a thick piece of stock. I found that if you let the bit cut out past the edge of the piece, the sawdust has a place to escape, and then your air quality monitor doesn't scream at you because your shop is full of smoke. Then at the band saw, I can cut all those pieces free. Now if I had a lathe in my shop, I probably would have used that to make all these pieces. But since I don't, I ended up tightening them one at a time onto a bolt and using a couple of nuts. Then I chucked that assembly into my drill and essentially used that along with my belt sander as a makeshift lathe. This took a while, but I can't argue with the results. They all turned out looking really nice. After that, I could countersink and drill a hole into each of the bases and then another hole into each one of the posts. 
But before I put these pieces together, I figured it would be easier to first vandalize the underside with my logo than to wait and try to do it later. And spraying on a little water first helps the brand come out just a bit more crisp. Now I can put a drop of glue on the post and then screw the bottom onto it. And of course, I had to use a flathead for at least one of them. Now I can finally start to put the puzzle together. I start by melting one of the ends of some paracord with a lighter because I'm a pyromaniac. I make sure it fits into the hole of one of the wooden discs and then I can secure it into place with a few drops of CA glue. Next I can put on one of the little beads, thread the cord through the post, add another bead, and then glue on another wooden disc. Now the object of this puzzle is to be able to add or remove one of your neighbor's curtain rings onto the post past the string. At first your brain wants to tell you that it's impossible, but as you can see, you can do it. There's just a trick to it. For a finish, I decided to use the same oil and wax as before since it's super easy to apply. And then these puzzles were done. This really is a fun puzzle. I enjoy this one a lot. So, I made a bunch of them to give away to some friends. They really did turn out great. The wooden discs and the little beads were a bit time consuming to make, but they add so much to the look of the piece. And the walnut bases and posts ended up having such a ton of character and figure which just makes them beautiful. And honestly, it wasn't that hard to batch out a bunch of them. These will make some great gifts. Okay. On to the next one. I was thinking that in order to make this last puzzle, I'll need to first make a jig so that I can cut the pieces out correctly. So I headed to the back of the shop to gather up some material. It'll just be a basic plywood table saw sled, so I'll need to make some runners for it that'll go into the miter slots of the saw. I use some really dense hardwood and I sneak up on the perfect fit so that they'll glide super smoothly in the slots. Then with that done, I can tilt the blade to a perfect 45 degrees and cut in a couple grooves down the length of the jig. Now these angled channels will be where the puzzle pieces are placed while they're being cut, so it's super important that I get them as accurate as I can. Next I use my router to add a 3 quarter inch dado down the center of the jig for some T-track. I just started by making a shallow pass and then gradually increased the depth until I was deep enough that the track would sit just below the surface of the jig. I cut down some pieces to use as a back fence and then I glue and I brad nail that into place. This jig isn't going to win any beauty contests and, and that's fine. It just needs to function properly and allow me to accurately cut these puzzle pieces out. And if I've thought this through correctly, I'll be able to do all the cuts for all the pieces using this jig along with a series of stop blocks. Now I can glue it down onto the runners. I space the runners up using some nuts, add some CA glue, and then watch as my camera runs out of battery and turns off. Then I replace the battery and pretend to still be gluing the jig together even though it's already done. But since I'm a genius at this, you'll never know. Unless I tell you, which I just did. I add a couple of screws just to reinforce things. And then I can glue on a front block. Now it's time for the first cut. I tilt the blade again to exactly 45 degrees and then I pass the jig over the top. I raise the blade up just a bit to cut a touch deeper and to break the surface of the plywood. This shows me exactly where the saw blade's going to be so that I can add some T-track but avoid those areas where the blade is. I put the track into the dado, position it near the kerf line without going over and then I make a mark where it needs to be cut. An angle grinder makes quick work of cutting it down the size and then I can glue it into place with some CA glue while shoving my head in front of the camera so that you can't see anything. I made these things off camera. I just ground down some bolts so that they would fit into the T-track and then I inlaid some nuts into some wooden knobs that'll fit on them. I cut out some stop blocks from some plywood and then I could slide them onto the jig. It took quite a bit of trial and error, as you can see from all my failures there on the table, but eventually I found just the right spots for each of the stop blocks so that I could cut out all the pieces perfectly. 
Here's how it works. Basically, you use the first two stop blocks in front to cut out two grooves that leaves kind of like a pyramid looking shape in the center of the piece, like that. Then a couple of the pieces use one of the blocks in the back to cut out a similar groove from the center making a weird looking piece like this. The last stop block in the back of the jig is used to add a bunch of chamfers to the corners of each piece that make them go together easier and it just sort of makes them look cooler. And that's it. And once assembled, it looks like this. It's pretty neat how they all fit together perfectly into this tight little star-like knot. However, there's one piece that once removed makes the whole thing fall apart in your hands. Then the question is, can you put it back together? So just to show you how fast you can actually make one of these puzzles using this jig, I decided to time myself. Now granted, I wasn't really working that fast, and in fact, I was kind of going slow, because my blade was getting dull, my back was killing me, and this video was dragging on and on, but in the end, I could make a complete puzzle in less than eight and a half minutes. That's not bad. And it turned out really nice looking too. I made this one out of Ipe, and I really like the dark, rich tones of the wood. I made a bunch more from a variety of other hardwoods, including Jera and rosewood and even zebra wood. Just like I did with the other puzzles, I finished each of the pieces with some oil and some wax, and then they're all done. Just check these things out. Don't they look awesome? And since all these pieces are similarly shaped, I could even mix and match them if I wanted to. That zebra wood one, though, that has got to be my favorite. That's pretty cool. Well, there you have it, folks. A whole bunch of puzzles that you can clutter up your desk with. But seriously, these things are fun to make. Make excellent gifts, and they sell really, really well at craft shows. So whether you're looking to build some for yourself, or you want to earn some money by selling them, pick up the detailed step-by-step -step instructions on how to make all three of these puzzles over at my website at fishersshoponline.com. Now I realized that I hid the solution for each of these puzzles in the video because I didn't want to spoil the challenge. However, if you want to see exactly how to solve each one of them, I'll post another video that demonstrates each one. There will be a link to that video in the video description below. I hope you enjoyed the project. If you feel I've earned it, consider subscribing to the channel, giving the video a like, and telling me which one of these puzzles you enjoyed the most in a comment down below. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Take care, and I'll see you next time. Oh man, I really blew out the back. Drop it, why don't you, idiot? I bet you it's hot. Holy crap, it's hot. Crap sticks. <laughs> it's not gonna go in that way. Yeah, the pieces moved in the clamps on the box joint jig, so these are bad, and that makes all of them bad. That kind of stinks.